Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream. My name is Mads Barami from Academic Innovation Team at Wolfram Research. We are very happy to host two leading researchers from Harvard and Quera, Dolev and Harry. Thanks for accepting our invitation. And today we'll be talking about fault tolerance quantum computing. Uh, there are a few other of my colleagues from Wolfram Research. We have John, Nick, and Yi. So, uh, and of course, like in our audience in the Zoom chat, uh, feel free, like, you know, we have Q&A, you know, put your questions there, like, you know, and uh, if I remember correctly, you know, Dolev, Harry, you guys are open to any question in the middle of your conversation, right? Like, you know, so by all means, like, you know, uh, our audience, please interrupt us, please ask questions. And, you know, we would love to hear from you guys. So let's go with a, you know, brief introduction. Dolev, Harry, you know, you know, let us know who are you guys? What are you up to? So I can start. My name is Dolev. I am a fifth year PhD student at Harvard. And uh, I am primarily an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my lab that I work in with other uh, colleagues. Uh, but I also like theory and mm -hmm. uh, specifically the theory of error correction. And my the main focus of my PhD has been the kind of discovery and development of this movement based approach uh, with atoms to quantum computing, and in particular its applications to error correction. Awesome, and we'll be discussing in much more detail. Harry, hi everyone. Um, I'm Harry. Uh, I'm in a joint position between Harvard and Quera, so partly a postdoc, partly a research scientist at Quera, um, and I work a lot on. Uh, architectural aspects of thinking about how we take the nice experimental tools that are pioneered by Dolev's experiment at Harvard and also being further uh, commercialized at Quera, um, thinking about how we can turn them into full-fledged for tolerant quantum computers and a lot of both the architectural and theoretical questions that surround that on the QEC side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. So of course, like, you know, the elephant in the in the room is, you know, fault tolerance quantum computing. And, you know, we want to discuss about that. But before jumping to the detail of like, you know, quantum error correction and the fancy uh, experiments that you guys did and published toward the end of 2023. Um, so I have a general question. There are a few candidates, promising candidates for quantum computing. We have superconducting qubits, we have trap atoms, ions, we have spin qubits, we have photonics. Why atoms? Oops, sorry. Should I do this, Harry? Do you want to? So okay. So the um, uh, you should take the next one. So the the so there's many different approaches and many different benefits to the different um approaches to quantum computing. My honest view is that this is an extremely challenging problem, and so at this stage of time, we should be kind of pursuing all of them. Uh, the reason that atoms are so special, and this will be central to what we talk about in the specific context of error correction, is that there are a lot of them, and mm -hmm. they're identical. I think that that's, those are the two really, really central aspects. And then there's a third aspect. So there's a lot of them, and they're identical. That really, I think, differentiates them from trapped ions and uh, superconducting qubits. But then the third way that that gets combined in quantum error correction is that they all need to do the same thing anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of makes them so powerful for realizing in particular error-corrected quantum computation. There's also some other really important features, like they have long coherence times. We can entangle them with high fidelity. We can move them around in the middle of the com quantum computation, which has you know a lot of strong benefits as well. But if I really were to summarize it, it's that there's you know tons of atoms, like millions of atoms every time we start one of our experiments, we drop in a cold cloud. Mm -hmm. And they're all identical. And for error correction, they just need to do the same thing anyway. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, the thing that's so powerful about the atomic approach. So, Harry, like, you know, talking about atoms, like, you know, what would be which of the elements in the periodic table are the best candidate for trap atoms and doing quantum computing? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and this is actually something that I would say is still open in the community. So we work with rubidium atoms, which mm -hmm. is... Um, probably one of the most standard atoms that people work with, very well understood. A lot of the atomic physics is very well worked out and people know very well how to control it. Uh, but there are also complementary approaches to this. For example, others use maybe cesium or, or also use a family of atoms, so-called alkaline mm -hmm. earth, which are things like strontium or ytterbium. Um, and I think really 
there's a lot of opportunities. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages. We like rubidium for its simplicity, and also we have demonstrated very good operations with it. But in the long run future, it's also possible that uh, other approaches could be equally interesting and uh, carry their own benefits for error correction as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask, like, you know, the, I, I'm sure you guys remember that. What was the atomic number of rubidium? <laughs> 87. <laughs> <laughs> I need to answer this one or I'm not going to get my PhD. <laughs> Excellent. Now, like, you know, for our audience, like, you know, uh, what you see in the background of Harry, yeah, that's a, you know, fake lab. Like, you know, the, he, he doesn't want to, like, you know, all, you know, show us the secret things that he's doing, you know, at Quero. And by the way, Quero, like, you know, one of our partners, on quantum computing and you would hear a lot much more about you know our partnership with them but uh what you see in the olive's background it's the real lab that's where that you know fancy experiment and that you know famous publication happened so Dolph, would it be possible that we take a quick tour of your lab and see like you know what, what's going on there and look at some sure, of the I devices can, i can give a small i can give a small tour mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, the um the i don't want to disrupt so we're currently taking some data i don't want to disrupt the other graduate students teaching oh, much. The already the, experiment is happening there already. Nice. Oh yeah, we're currently taking some data. So okay. this this is, I guess, what I had previously alluded to, uh, um, before the call. But so this is the this single box. Inside of it, there is a laser, and it does all of our single qubit control. That mm -hmm. you know across the entire system, there is mm -hmm. you know one microwave oscillator, right up here. Mm -hmm. This one microwave oscillator controls the single qubit state of all of our qubits. Again, because all of the qubits are identical. And so if you're kind of just trying to track the state of all of them, you can do this with one microwave oscillator. And then uh, I unfortunately can't open it right now because we're in the middle of taking data. I mean, you can see mm -hmm. some kind of various lasers here. There's also a high power laser here that we use for entangling our atoms mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. of this uh, big black box that we can't open right now because we're taking data is where all of these experiments happen. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. So um, inside that black box, we have the rubidium atoms. They are they are there. They are trapped. That's there. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how many of them, like you know, already, like you know, what is the maximum numbers that you guys can trap? So when we trap them before an experiment happens, we trap mm -hmm. you know roughly ten million. And this is mm -hmm. very standard. This is using standard magneto optical trapping techniques. People have trapped you know things at the scale of you know ten billion. So there's truly many many atoms, and they're all again old and identical, and they're packed into the several millimeter region of space mm -hmm. uh, using standard atomic physics techniques. So that just makes this cold cloud of atoms. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. the question is how to control all of them. And then we turn on optical tweezers that are tightly focused beams of light that each of them snag exactly one atom or mm -hmm. with 50% probability it snags an atom. Uh, and that we've done up to the scale of, you know, roughly a thousand atoms. But there's also, for example, very nice recent work from the Caltech group doing this at the scale of, you know, 6,000 atoms. Mm -hmm. So this is something that can, you know, pretty readily just continued to increase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we have an interesting audience question already, which, uh, so uh, th this is tied in with this phenomenon of Rydberg blockade that I'm, I'm hoping you can also elaborate on a little bit more for the audience. But the audience question is, um, you know, what are some advantages on rubidium as opposed to, to other atoms and, and connected with that? You know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, th this really interesting phenomenon of Rydberg blockade that allows you to, to use them uh, for various purposes? Do you want to do this one, Harry? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so rubidium uh, is, I guess, it's in the first column of the periodic table, if you look at it. And what that means is that outside of the, of the core, you have one electron uh, zooming around there. So you might imagine that a lot of its structure is actually very similar to the hydrogen atom, uh, which we learn at the very beginning of um, say quantum mechanics classes. Uh, because of this, it has a very simple structure that is almost the same as the hydrogen atom, except with some differences in the actual numbers of the wavelengths and whatnot. Um, and that's what makes it simple as compared to, for example, strontium or ytterbium, where now you have two electrons hanging out there. Um, and there's a little bit more complications in terms of singlets or triplets or other types of features in the structure. Those, of course, are still very interesting if you are able to control them. And there's excellent work in in groups like Jeff Thompson at Princeton, Manuel Endres at uh, Caltech, Adam Kaufman at Gila, and many other places, um, trying to gain better control of these types of systems. But for us, mm -hmm. uh, when we first started, we wanted to use the simplest atom with the best uh, understood uh, characteristics. And so that's why we went for rubidium. 
Now, um, part of this uh, gate operations uses the so-called Rydberg blockade that you mentioned. Uh, and what this is, is basically uh, when we want to have the atoms strongly interact with each other, what we do is we actually excite them all the way up to the so-called Rydberg state. So you, the way you can think about them is that the electron gets kicked into an orbit that is very large. Mm -hmm. uh, this large orbit means that if two atoms are next to each other, they'll now start to talk to each other very strongly. And so they actually can't simultaneously go up into this very big orbit. Uh, mm -hmm. And what this means then is that you have interactions, which then uh, subsequently leads to the actual gate operation. Mm -hmm. Now, another feature of the blockade is that if the two atoms are next to each other, as long as they're within some radius, the so-called blockade radius, then as long as they're within this radius, they'll have this strong interaction and the gate will operate. And so it makes for a very nice and uh, relatively insensitive gate to things like position, uh, positional placement fluctuations because the gate works as long as you're within some radius. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. By the way, like, you know, don't let Harry, like, you know, if, if you guys want to share a screen and like, you know, show any presentations that you may have, like, you know, for audience, by all means, please go ahead. Um, now, talking about, like, you know, those atoms, like, you know, uh, what are the energy levels, like, you know, like, you know, because when we talk about qubits, qubits, like, you know, it's two level, right? Like, you know, the up and down or zero and one, but those rubidium atoms, like, you know, if anybody, you know, goes through, like, you know, your papers, they would notice, you know, there are actually three levels that you guys are manipulating. So how come, like, you know, this three level, like, you know, atom reflects in two? So that's the first question. So let's discuss the first question, and then I'm going to ask another follow-up question. Well, so there's the three, so there's qubit states zero and one, mm -hmm. and these live within what we call the orbital ground state of the atom. So, you know, these are low states. They're separated by a microwave transition. That's why we use a microwave oscillator to drive transitions between them. Uh, and this is very long lived. I mean, the, it's really easy to keep track of the phase of this, you know, microwave oscillator and this microwave qubit. And because it's such a low energy separation. Uh, and so the coherence is, you know, seconds in our system and can be even mm -hmm. longer. Uh, but, you know, but they're also, I mean, one of their features is they're magnetically insensitive. And so they're so long lived, but it also makes them essentially, you know, very challenging to interact. And that's why we excite atoms to these third levels that Harry had mentioned, these Rydberg states, where now we, you know, take this, you know, spin up state, and then we excite it so that it's going to this huge orbital state. And now the atom grows tremendously in size. Its coherence is much shorter. It's still quite long, but it's much shorter. And, but now it interacts very strongly with its environment. Mm -hmm. And this can be used for entanglement. Mm -hmm. So we store mm -hmm. information inside of this hyperfine qubit, we call it. And, but we only very quickly go to this Rydberg state for generating entanglement. And then we come back down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, like, you know, that coherence time that you said, like, you know, they live much longer in the, in the excited state. That's the main reason that they are a good candidate compared to the other elements in the first row of the periodic table. Well, say, why not sodium? Because sodium, like, you know, when you, it goes to the excited state, you know, it's going to decay very fast. And rubidium, like, you know, it's much longer. And that's why, like, you know, that's a better candidate. So, so actually, so it really um, depends on what you're, what you're looking for. So atomic physicists are inventive and have trapped and manipulated many, many species of atoms. Actually, the atoms in the first row of the periodic table are the ones that we've manipulated the most because they're, mm -hmm. they're like hydrogen. They're hydrogenic. They have a single extra electron and this makes all of their structure is actually pretty much the same. So actually sodium and, you know, rubidium and cesium, they all actually behave quite similarly. There's, and then, then there's, you know, subtleties between them, you know, and then, so, so actually you can do, you know, high fidelity operations with rubidium, cesium, sodium, all like potassium, all in very similar ways. Um, and the Rydberg states are, you know, actually almost exactly the same because it's, it's, it looks like a hydrogen atom at that point. Now that this electron is so far away, um, from the nucleus. Uh, and then there's just really slight subtleties between them in terms of what are the exact optical wavelengths that we use, which optical wavelengths do we want to use, what is the microwave separation between the, mm -hmm. the qubit states. So really, really nuanced decisions. And people have made so much progress in atomic physics using rubidium uh, and also you know other atoms. But specifically, a lot of it has been rubidium. And so it's just a very well-developed atom that has you know nice wavelengths. Excellent. So, like, you know, from a 
theory perspective. So we have a bunch of atoms, they are trapped, and then there is a laser field interacting with them, rabbit drive, like, you know, phase, etc., detuning. And uh, if a physicist wants to describe that, you know, they would just set the Hamiltonian, and then we evolve the Hamiltonian, and that's like, you know, we basically study a time evolution. That's a very typical example, like, like you know, physicists, they learn in, like, you know, the elementary quantum mechanic textbook. But this is not like, you know, the typical paradigm of gate-based quantum computing. But it seems to me that you guys, like, you know, this is the underlying dynamic. It's a Hamiltonian evolution, but it can be translated, it can be mapped into a gate-based, like, you know, paradigm. H how that's possible? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, first I should say that uh, even beyond our system, in many cases, for example, for superconducting qubits, underlying the, the actual system is still a Hamiltonian. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that historically they, they moved from this paradigm of thinking about this slightly more analog natured natural evolution of the system into focusing on gates a little bit sooner than, than our community. Um, but underlying all of these gates, is indeed some Hamiltonian evolution that we try to program and control. And I think uh, for us, really a big change in our mindset and why we now have, have, uh, have been doing a lot more work focusing on digital evolution is the fact that we can now have a lot of flexible control through the types of techniques such as atom moving that Dollar pioneered, such that you can reprogram things into discrete blocks um, mm -hmm. and you do some analog Hamiltonian evolution within the block, actually this Rydberg blockade that we utilize to do the gates is actually almost exactly the same as what is used for these analog quantum simulation experiments that you might also be familiar uh, from mm -hmm. a lot of the Harvard work and from the query machine online. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so it really is using the same mechanism, but now with the additional flexibility of things like atom moving, uh, you can then also do a lot more individual manipulations that allow you to use the same tool set and do quantum gates with it. Um, so really mm -hmm. underlying it is all the same mechanisms. Um, it's just that now with this new suite of controllability, uh, you can also then chop it up into discrete parts and, and do digital evidence. Okay. So right now we have Aquela, which is accessible through a cloud service to all of the users. And the experiment that you guys did, like, you know, the main feature is the possibility of, like, you know, moving the atoms using optical tweezer, right? So, is it correct that that feature is not yet available publicly? Like, you know, so the users, you know, they cannot do it themselves. Like, they cannot have the possibility of moving the atoms, right? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Quara doesn't yet have a system that is uh, capable of supports um, mid-circuit coherent movement mm -hmm. of the atoms around in the system. But I should mention that actually a lot of the same optical tweezer tools that you use to do those mid-circuit manipulations are actually the ones that we use for the initial sorting of the atoms. So a lot mm -hmm. of the basic capabilities are there. Um, it, it just takes a little bit of time to, to fully get all of the um, operations uh, packaged and tuned up and, and uh, well calibrated in a way that is available for broader uh, usage. Uh, but definitely stay tuned about that and, and hopefully um, in the in the coming uh, coming uh, time, you'll be able to also access that on, on the cloud. Excellent, excellent. Looking forward to that. So uh, Dolev, like, you know, you mentioned your PhD was specifically about like, you know, this movement based, like, you know, atom manipulation for quantum computing. Why do we need that? Why we need to move atoms? Oh, great. Well, um, well, first I should say that, you know, the way, so, I mean, we, we have kind of been, you know, random walking around into these kind of various things. So, I mean, the first, the first reason that we, you know, tried moving atoms around was for actually a completely different application. We were doing analog quantum simulation mm -hmm. this was with another student at the time, Harry Levine. We were doing analog quantum simulation and we wanted to measure entanglement entropy. And we, you know, made two copies. It turns out if you make two copies of a quantum state, you can actually interfere them by, you know, putting them on top of each other and, you know, doing a gate between them. And then we were trying to use this as a way to enhance our, you know, analog capabilities. And it was mm -hmm. not working very well originally due to some bugs. 
Uh, and then we started, you know, having this vision of, well, can we program arbitrary circuits in this way and have a, you know, fully programmable processor with any to any connectivity? And it turned out that it was working quite well. Mm -hmm. And that that's kind of what had, you know, and then it turned out that that was actually very powerful for error correction. So in terms of how we got here in, in answering your question, I mean, it was kind of, you know, like scientific random walk. Um, okay, now that we're here, <laughs> then, you know, like, why is it so useful? So, okay, there's two, maybe two different answers I would give. So one is that if you want to have, you know, hundreds of qubits and you want to run an arbitrary quantum circuit on them, it can be very constrained if you only have 2D connectivity. There are some problems that map to that, but there are many, many that don't. And what we would like to do are develop devices that with hundreds or many more qubits, you can just run any quantum circuit. And mm -hmm. any quantum evolution you can write down in that way, you can just, you know, directly program. Currently, we're doing this, you know, manually by hand. But, you know, in the future for, you know, like Quera, for example, like, you know, that's something that someone would be able to do over the cloud, which is amazing, right? Any mm -hmm. quantum circuit you want, you know, any to any connectivity between qubits. Uh, so that that's, you know, just very powerful for exploring quantum computation in the lab. In terms of exploring error correction, so that's something that we, I guess, have been kind of, you know, talking around so far. But when we're building quantum devices, it turns out that to make them really, really large, we're going to eventually need to take our qubits and then entangle them into what we call error-corrected qubits or logical qubits. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there it turns out that moving qubits around for this very central application is central. I and see. I would I would maybe summarize that in two ways, and then we can talk about maybe why error correction is so important later. But but one is that you know now what we do is when we make an error corrected qubit, we take this single qubit and then we you know spread it out. We take a single qubit of information we care about and then we hide it across many physical qubits. And now it's this big block. And if you have this big block and you have two of these big blocks and you're trying to interact them, it can be very hard to interact them through an interface. But now that we're thinking about, you know, error corrected quantum bits and we want to do operations on, you know, error corrected, you know, in an error corrected processor, if we can move qubits around, then now each of these blocks essentially just looks like one bigger, you know, qubit. And now we can take these two blocks, put them right on top of each other, and then, you know, interact them as if they were just, you know, two really big particles. Uh, and that's one of the approaches, one of the reasons that moving qubits around is so powerful. I see. I see. So talking about like, you know, error correction from the onset of, you know, quantum computing, you know, everybody was saying, you know, look, you know, to attain quantum value, fault tolerance seems the only way. Like there, there is no way around, like you cannot like, you know, the, find any alternative solution. At least as of now, you know, all the community agrees, you know, this is the way. So wh why we need error correction and how we implement that in, in the lab? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think fundamentally it boils down to many of the actual advantages that people have been able to show for quantum computing rely on error rates that are very low. Uh, so just as an example, typically nowadays we're thinking about 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3 physical error rates for our qubits. Um, and that is already quite impressive at the physical level. But if you think about, for example, a short algorithm or many really large scale quantum chemistry algorithms that you'd want to do for an actual application, you're then looking at an error rate that is something like 10 to the minus 12. And in some sense, maybe that shouldn't come as a surprise because if we think about our classical computers, they're just doing perfect operations all the time. And typically the number of operations that we're doing is actually also something that is probably on that order. So we really want to be able to do that many operations without getting any errors. And this is just exceedingly hard to do if you think about this massive gap between this 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus three, which means maybe a thousand or so operations to these trillions of operations that you would want to do in these, in these uh, applications with provable advantage. And so this is where error correction comes in. And it really, when it first came out, was quite a surprise that you could really do error correction and you could really tolerate an error in principle in any component of your circuit. This is the concept of so-called fault tolerance. And the basic idea is that by encoding your uh, quantum information, your qubit, into multiple degrees of freedom, you can really now be robust to any disturbance in a single location or in a few locations because you can use the rest of the system 
to fix that and recover the actual information that you want. And so using this idea, it turns out that as you increase the system size, you can actually improve your logical error rate exponentially in your system size as long as your physical error rate is below a certain threshold, the so-called error correction threshold. And so this then gives us a path to maybe be able to achieve very low uh, logical error rates with a, a resource overhead that is growing relatively slowly um, uh, in terms of the physical uh, qubit that you need. Mm -hmm. It is still, in practice, a pretty large overhead. So for example, for the standard surface code schemes that people use, people are typically thinking about maybe a thousand or so physical qubits per logical qubit, still a pretty daunting number. Um, and we actually have some active work uh, um, in collaboration between Harvard, Chicago, and Cura, and some other institutions of coming up with new error correction schemes that can substantially reduce that overhead. But still, it is a very daunting challenge and definitely one of the core research areas that the community will need to continue making progress on as we go towards these large-scale quantum computations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We do have another uh, audience question, which, which uh, I think both of you could could elaborate on. And this is, you know, help them understand the difference between physical qubits and logical qubits. And then also uh, the scale that you mentioned of needing, say, a thousand physical qubits per logical qubit. Or, you know, what, what are the, the things that we're hoping to get to both in the near and maybe, you know, uh, optimistically uh, near future terms? You want to do this one, Harry? Uh, yeah, so I guess the first question was the difference between uh, logical and physical qubits, right? Um, yeah, so uh, fundamentally, they're both encoding some qubit information. Um, but the main difference is that for logical qubits, now this qubit information is spread over multiple physical qubits um, so that now if any individual physical qubit had an error, you can still recover from that error. Maybe just to make an analogy that hopefully will help illustrate this in a more familiar setting. Uh, let's say we have a classical bit of information. Um, so we just have a zero or one. And if we just had a single one of those bits, if someone comes along and, and secretly flips that bit, uh, then we would uh, by itself have no way of recovering of it because maybe the bit was flipped in the first place before they even came along. Um, However, what we can do is we can then take several of these bits. So for example, you take three bits and now encode them into a repetition code. Then if someone comes along and flips one of them, you can still do a majority vote and recover the actual information by flipping that one back because the other two were still in the correct state. So the same idea um, is generalizable to the quantum case. It becomes a little bit more involved, but the basic idea is very similar. Um, and so by using this redundancy, you can then recover from individual physical errors. Uh, and, and what was the second question again? Sorry. So the, the second part of the question was, uh, you know, where, where do you think uh, things are going in terms of the uh, number of logical qubits that uh, can, or excuse me, the number of physical qubits that are needed to uh, encode a logical qubit? So both currently and then in the near and optimistic uh, look. Right, yes. Yeah, and, and so that's that's also a very good question. So I already mentioned this roughly 1,000 qubit, physical qubit per logical qubit for the standard surface code architecture. Um, and some of the work that we've been doing on these uh, so-called quantum low-density parity check code or quantum LDPC codes, some of these new code families can actually have a higher encoding rate. And the way it works is that you encode many logical qubits into many physical qubits. So now the protection is shared across all of them. And what this means is that you can be much more efficient in encoding the, the qubits. Uh, we're not the only ones working on this. There's also some very nice work from many people in the community, both academics and industry. Um, a, a contemporary work with our proposal was, for example, a paper from IBM uh, proposing some certain architectures uh, in their case, which might be a little bit more complicated to implement but nonetheless provide some very interesting code families. Um, and so here, what we're really looking at are now numbers that maybe you could perhaps have maybe on the order of 20 physical qubits per logical qubit rather than a thousand. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is certainly still sustained research in this area, both thinking about better encodings, 
as well as once you have those encodings, how to co-design them with the logical gate operations that you obviously would also want to do for the computation. And so I think it's a very um, exciting and interesting area of research <laughs> that we'll continue to see a lot of uh, fantastic work of in the in the coming years. Mm -hmm. And this ties in with something that, that Dolev was mentioning before, perhaps we could elaborate a little bit more on, which is that um, being able to spread out the logical qubit in terms of these movable atoms so that, that that information is encoded not in a local place, but you, you can move it around so that you can interact with them more easily later. Um, I wonder if we could uh, elaborate just on that detail a little bit more for the audience. Sure. So so yeah, when, when we do quantum error correction, what we're physically doing so, so I mean, it's actually it's remarkable error correction is possible in the first place. So Harry gave this example of classical error correction where you copy bits. You can't copy quantum bits. It's one. It's a fundamental. There's this no cloning theorem. This is part of the reason why it was so amazing when Peter Shore and others kind of invented quantum error correction 30 years ago. But so what you use is entanglement. You take a you know qubit and then you spread it out such that if the environment comes in and it measures any given physical qubit that physical qubit is so entangled with its neighbors that it will reveal identically zero information. So this is very fundamental. And this is how we're kind of, yeah. So that, that's how we do making these logical qubits. But now that they're delocalized, you know, and they're hidden, you know, and things don't locally contain the information. Now, if you want to, for example, do an operation between these two things, but they don't locally contain this information, how do you do it? It's actually very challenging. You need to do, you know, many different tricks and for example, if you know if things are on this 2D grid and you want these two delocalized wave functions to interact, we have to do techniques that we sometimes call lattice surgery or braiding. Mm -hmm. Things that things that end up taking, you know, a number of operations that scale with the size of this, mm -hmm. you know, delocalized degree of freedom. But when we can move qubits around, what we do is we effectively just, you know, take these two blocks, put them right on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And then we can entangle the logical qubits using a, using a type of operation that we call transversal. And transversal here, what it loosely means is to do this gate on the logical degree of freedom that's delocalized. Just do that exact same gate on all of the physical qubits that make up the block. And it turns out that a lot of gates and a lot of error correcting codes, not all of them, but most of them can be done this way. And so, for example, if I have a single logical qubit and I want to do a Hadamard on it, just like we're used to doing with physical qubits, it turns out what you don't need to do often is something unique to each individual physical qubit of the block. You can do it transversely. You mm -hmm. can just do the same Hadamard on all of the physical qubits that make up the block. And this is what's so powerful about you know, the atomic approach, where all of the qubits are identical. The mm -hmm. light to do a Hadamard on all of them is identical. And we effectively just now take one big beam and illuminate this you know, big atom, effectively you know, big qubit, with this big beam and in this way, do a logical Hadamard by just doing the same physical Hadamard instruction on all of the physical qubits of the block. And remarkably, this can also be done for the entangling gate. We can do it in this transversal way to do a transversal c naught, where we just take these two degrees of freedom, put them on top of each other, and now do the exact same physical c naught operation using a global entangling beam mm -hmm. on all of the twins of these two blocks. And in this single transversal step, we can entangle these logical degrees of freedom. And that, that's you know, part of what makes this approach so powerful. Again, the other aspect of, you know, moving that makes things very par powerful is, as Harry mentioned, the ability to make exotic types of error correcting codes, like, for example, LDPC codes that have, you know, very dense encoding rates. That's, you know, one type of, you know, really useful exotic code. In our work, we also made 3D error correction codes. So we made both 2D and 3D, where now we delocalize it over, you know, just like 3D block. And this actually also has some, you know, really powerful features. So the ability to have very flexible connectivity for error correction is actually a, is very useful in, in mm -hmm. many, many areas. And, and this very is directly reflected in the, in the fact that you have, uh, you know, one uh, microwave resonator rather than uh, needing to have many for each physical qubit. Exactly. That is exactly right. And so not, so it's already useful for doing physical qubit computations. We're now, okay, we simplify the control problem. We have one global oscillator. And, you know, if you want to do a Hadamard on half of your atoms, then you know, then you can do it with this one thing. That's already useful, right? When we're doing programming quantum circuits. And then there's mm -hmm. one more remarkable fact that really comes together, which is that for error correction, they only need to do the same thing anyway. And, and the combination of those two with the atomic approach and kind of using global parallel and efficient controls is, is what has allowed us to so rapidly take off 
in terms of these advanced error correction circuits. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have another audience question, which is uh, a, a little bit more general, which is uh, understanding the connection between analog versus digital quantum computing. So uh, I wonder if we could maybe uh, take a, a slight turn into that before uh, getting back to error correcting in particular. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I guess there are many different modalities that you can imagine for when you're trying to use a quantum device. Uh, so as we already discussed, underlying these systems uh, usually is some, in, in reality, some analog Hamiltonian. Uh, even in the case of supernatant qubits, actually, there's also uh, the same thing. And actually, I think there's, for example, Google had some interesting work trying to do simulation by utilizing more the native Hamiltonian. For us, uh, historically, the cold atoms community, um, because of uh, both what was most natural with the control um, and the fact that you could rapidly go to large system sizes where now simulation of just the native Hamiltonian itself is suddenly already at least non-trivial, um, if not uh, actually uh, completely intractable classically. That meant that there was a lot of interesting work that you could already explore, um, both on the physics side and starting to think a little bit um, about some heuristics on the application side. Uh, such as these maximum independent set problems that was explored um, in some Harvard experiments, uh, a, a science paper from, from a couple of years ago, um, you could already explore some of these applications in this setting. And so uh, really in the analog case, what you're trying to do is to find natural mappings from a problem of interest. This could be quantum simulation or some application like optimization, mapping that directly onto the Hamiltonian of your system. In the digital case, instead of trying to use these very native encodings, you're trying instead to now use it as, uh, as a universal computer where you have these discrete building blocks and you try to piece those building blocks together. The advantage is that now, in principle, you could do anything. You now have a universal quantum computer in principle, uh, but of course it also comes with a cost where maybe your encoding is now not as native in the other case. And so I think, there's an interesting regime, uh, especially with these near-term devices, where for some things, the analog evolution is, is, uh, is something that would still be more effective than just directly running the digital. And this is something that we, we are still continuing to do in our community. Uh, so for example, after the recent error correction experiments at Harvard, there was a little bit of a, um, uh, a refreshing break in between. Uh, where, where some uh, back to our old quantum simulation, analog uh, simulation routes, where some interesting experiments were run there um, before we re return to some more gate-based operation. And I think the really beautiful thing is that it actually uh, doesn't take that long to switch between the two modalities, because as we mentioned, you're really using the same tool set. And so you could in principle even, and this was already demonstrated uh, to some degree in some of the early experiments that Dolev mentioned, um, with this atom moving approach, or you could even take a hybrid approach of doing some analog evolution and then doing some gates afterwards. So I think that both they're both interesting in their own aspects and complementary in many ways. Very interesting. So regarding like you know the, the your work, you know uh, the error correction code is like you know basically like you know an error happens like you know you detect that and then you correct it. And uh, these three steps are usually like, you know, experimentally, they are very complicated, how, how you would implement that. And of course, like, you know, there is a zoo of like, you know, different theoretical approach for quantum error correction. Uh, which one you guys pick and, and why? Basically, like, you know, this question is related to your collaboration with theory groups because you guys are experimentalists. And then there has been lots of like, you know, research on quantum error correction by theories. Which one you decided, oh, this is a good fit for our specific like, you know, device and why you went in that direction? So, okay, so here I would illuminate that, that the, so the path is very long and in terms of building a large scale device, and we are really looking for as many shortcuts as possible. So that, that is, I think, a founding principle. And, and, uh, and you know, in that spirit, we don't want to just make error correcting codes. We want to study algorithms between them. And that is quite nuanced and quite, you know, uncharted, even from a theoretical perspective. So there was a lot of, you know, back and forth. 
uh, between us and also theorists in the department uh, that, you know, contributed to this work and, and also in, you know, theoretical uh, collaborators at other institutions as well. And so in our work, we made three different types of error correcting codes. We made surface codes. We made the largest surface codes that have, have been made and then we entangled them. Uh, and uh, here, the feature is that the surface codes are the most tolerant to errors, at least in most contexts. Uh, and they're also very standard error correcting codes that are well understood. We also made things that are very similar to the surface code or this, this 2D surface code, which is a 2D color code. So it's similar instead of being on the square lattice, it's a kind of on a triangular lattice and it's colored. Uh, and this is very similar to the surface code in many ways. But one of the ways it's actually very different for practical operations is that the surface code can't do as many operations conveniently. This 2D color code can do, however, all of the Clifford gates. It can do Hadamard, S, and C0. And it can do them without requiring any lattice rotations, which is the kind of subtlety that makes it a little harder for the surface code. This, from a practical perspective, is so useful because now with our logical qubits, any Clifford circuit you would want to run with physical qubits, you can now do that exact same thing with the logical circuit. So we can run any Clifford circuit in this way with these color codes. That was a really big feature of choosing them. And then we, in our last experiment, we made 3D color codes. And um, these have their own kind of quirks that are very useful. So uh, they lose one of the Clifford operations. They can't do Hadamards. So a really important thing I've swept under the rug is that in order to error correct, you need to digitize. And you need to have you know, a digital gate set. And it needs to be a discrete gate set. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no way around it. This is very fundamental to the fact that you need to be able to be robust to you know, small angles. Uh, so it's a huge difference than working with physical qubits. And so it constrains the problem in very different ways. And so you have to think, what code do I come up with that has a convenient gate set for whatever problem I'm trying to solve? So in the 2D codes, we can do, for example, all of these Clifford group, Clifford gates, but we can't do small angle rotations. And in particular, we can't do a gate that we call non-Clifford, like a CCZ gate, controlled controlled Z. And we need non-Clifford gates in order to do things that are you know, classically you know, not, you know, you know, linear or quadratic time to simulate, you know, that, that are kind of exponential time to simulate. And so for our 3D error correcting codes, even though we lost one of our gates, we lost our Hadamard, what we do get are non-Clifford's. Mm -hmm. And what we did is found a very specific circuit, like a scrambling circuit or a sampling circuit that, okay, these 3D error correcting codes to do a generic arbitrary quantum circuit will have some cost associated with it that, you know, requires some, you know, extensive compilation. But for this specific algorithm, it can be realized in a very efficient way. And, you know, and that allowed us to explore really complex algorithms with logical qubits by, again, finding a shortcut that for this specific algorithm with this specific error correcting code, you can realize it in a very cheap way. So, okay, we, so that's kind of a summary of, you know, the smorgasbord of experiments that we did. We, you know, nothing we did is perfect. Everything kind of has its own limitations, but together it kind of, you know, paints a picture of you know different features of error correcting codes, you know like large error correcting codes, complex operations, you know programmability, and so on, and kind of where we see it kind of progressing into the future by kind of being able to combine all these various features. Excellent. So like you know, uh, given that that paper, like you know, because like you know, many different researchers, the students, like, you know, they would read it and of course, like, you know, they would be motivated to work on, on, on this field. Basically like, you know, uh, quantum error correction plus quantum computing. Uh, from your perspective, you guys, as the, basically the co-author, co the, the guys who were basically behind the scene, like, uh, what do you think are the most important take home message for the reader of that works? Like, you know, how would you summarize that? Maybe I can start and then Harry, you can you can add your your own perspectives. So the okay, so what I would say, so I would maybe have two two central lessons. So one would be to kind of people who are more, you know, interested on the kind of algorithm and error correction side as like theorists. And it would it would be that when we do things with physical qubits and we do things with logical qubits, it can be very different. So something I just alluded to is that, you know, physical qubits, they can do any single qubit gate they want. It's very easy to do a small angle rotation, but entanglement is often hard. Logical qubits is a completely different space. Actually, it turns out almost all error correcting codes we're interested in can do an entangling CNOT between these logical qubits in a simple transversal way. 
but actually single arbitrary single qubit rotations are the hardest thing to do, you know, in most cases. So, you know, it's actually a very different problem. And the things we're used to thinking about in terms of what's easy and hard for physical qubits is a completely different world for logical qubits. And at least in, you know, my view, the space of how do we find good ways to program error corrected quantum circuits, which is what we would like to do going into the future, is an extremely open space that is also extremely ripe for breakthroughs. And, you know, we found a specific algorithm that can be realized in a very inexpensive way with error correcting codes. We would like to find more of these. You know, we can make a whole database of them, you know, different algorithms that can be cheaply found with different types of error correcting codes. And right now we're kind of, you know, finding shortcuts that are maybe interesting for these short-term problems. But if we do it right, these kind of shortcuts we find now will scale into the future. And some of, the, some of these will be applicable on the large scale. And that's the kind of goal. So poking around with these near-term devices, what I would call these like early generation logical devices is what we currently have. Figuring out what is attainable and then figuring out, you know, which shortcuts that we found can be used in the future as well. I think that that's an, it's an extremely exciting time and there's so much that has not yet been done. So that is what I would personally, you know, that from a theoretical perspective, I think that's a really important takeaway. From an experimental perspective and also experimental, but also kind of like error correction theorist, I think this kind of co-design of the experiment and theory is so critical where, you know, we're benefiting so tremendously from, you know, collaboration with our theoretical colleagues as well. But, you know, for example, this observation that for error correcting codes, we just need to do, you know, the exact same operation on all the qubits anyway. And then for our atoms, it's, they're all identical and they all do the exact same operation using the exact same light. And then that, this works so well for, for realizing error corrected quantum computation. I think there's many more kind of less, lessons like this that we would like to keep learning into the future. And if I, if I were to work on a different system, like superconducting qubits or ions or whatever, every day I would wake up and I would ask how to do this in that system. Because I think it, it is really the central thing that has allowed us to kind of so quickly take off. So those are my, my kind of two lessons. I'm sure Harry has some other kind of interesting perspectives though. Yeah, I think that actually also mostly summarizes what, what I would say. Maybe one thing to, to uh, uh, slightly rephrase the latter point is that one of the things that uh, the community has, has really been uh, discovering more and more, not just in our work, but in previous error correction work is this concept of hardware efficiency. But I think what we, what we put on the map is also this aspect of control efficiency. So not just that you want the, you want the error correction to be hardware efficient, but also a lot of the complexity, especially when you think about these large scale systems comes from the control. So for example, our classical computer chips they're doing billions of operations and billions of elements in there, but usually the actual external control that you have going into the CPU uh, is actually fairly limited. Maybe a thousand or so control lines or wires going in there, um, and a lot of the other stuff is then run autonomously. Right now, a lot of the systems that we have uh, tend to be of the nature where you really have one or even several control lines per qubit that you're controlling, and I think that's the control efficient aspect is also another thing that really is highlighted in, in our philosophy and for which I think other communities are also starting to make progress on. But that's also another aspect very related to what Dolev was just saying um, that really is highlighted by our work. Excellent. You mentioned in your paper uh, that, that you know, the, these methods uh, you expect could be scaled to something like 10,000 physical qubits. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what, what sort of timeline are, are you, know, you all thinking for, for when you're going to, you know, really scale up the, the number of things that you want to do with these? So, I mean, so the field is broad and there's many kind of amazing groups working in it. And actually one can find a paper from just, you know, like a week ago uh, from the Caltech group getting to 6,100 atoms, for example. I mean, so far, just trapping them, not really doing manipulations on them. Uh, but, but I mean, so I think the scale of 10,000 atoms is, you know, impending. And I think so, I mean, yeah, I mean, so we're, we're currently working on various things. And I'm speaking on behalf of Harvard. I don't know if Harry has anything he wants to say on, you know, behalf of what's happening at Quera. But the, um, but I mean, the scale of 10,000 atoms is, is I, I can't give it, you know, I shouldn't say a number, but it's impending. I mean, it's really easy to have lots of atoms. That, that is, I think, clear. The, we also need to get to higher fidelities to really be able to use these atoms very well. We want to get to, you know, 
three nines gate fidelity roughly currently we're at 99.55 percent gate fidelity this is something that i think we also have a plan for and i would say is also impending and i mean in my broad view in the kind of coming years pretty soon we will have all of the ingredients that we need for making you know, what i would describe as medium scale error corrected devices where you can do something like a hundred logical qubits that can do a million logical gates without having an error and if we can create a device like this in the lab in the kind of coming years, we will have the ability to explore quantum computation and just quantum mechanics in a way that we've just never been able to touch. I mean, it's it's a completely different type of quantum computer to the ones that we have today. I mean, it will not have errors, for example. For short circuits, you know, we will it will just be flawless evolution. And that is that is, I think, amazing. And so I think, but I, and I think it's impending. So that that's uh yeah, that's my statement i don't know uh what harry has to say so in uh, so don't live in terms of like you know the the number of like you know uh the qubits that you can trap and basically like you know as your physical qubits what are the experimental limits like is there any upper limit you would say you know look you know current like you know features that we have in the laser fields etc cetera, etc cetera, we cannot go beyond this number for the next five ten years like what are those limits like you know are we at the limit or there is still you know a lot that we can push so okay so currently in our lab we have a roughly 10 watt laser that traps roughly a thousand atoms um it's actually one of the lasers that you briefly saw but the uh so if you came to the lab tomorrow and you know tomorrow you at the same laser wavelength you plopped in a hundred watt laser then you know we would immediately have ten thousand atoms we would just split the same laser beam into more spots using what one of our devices that we call a spatial light modulator it takes a single laser beam and then it sp splits it into you know our thousand individual tweezers we would split it into ten thousand tweezers and then we would immediately have ten thousand atoms so you know in the sense it's you know you know impending um and uh however if you came into the lab and you plop down a hundred kilowatt laser it would destroy the lab so um you know so what things we need to do to get beyond this so okay i would say the path to get to these like medium scale error corrected devices at least the way that i would describe them if there's like 100 logical qubits million logical gates with like 10,000 atoms that have you know three nines gate fidelity that i think can be just done by just cranking the laser power knob essentially much beyond that to get to 10 million atoms i think you know might benefit from some kind of greater creativity and so it's harder to 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 put you know a specific perspective on that yeah. And I guess also there's active developments in the community, for example, for networking multiple of these models. These are still early on in the in their development trajectory, but for example, there's there's very nice work actually in the lab right across the wall from where where the lab is sitting. Um, there's another lab working on networking. There's also active efforts in the community with many different complementary approaches. So that's also a route that you could imagine then linking many of these 10,000 qubit modules together into a larger, uh, much larger scale, uh, full-fledged full uh, quantum computer. I see, I see. So Harry, I have a generic question for you. Like, you know, how was the transition from academia to industry? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I guess as you, as you know, in, in my position, it's still currently still a bit of a mix between getting some academic contact and getting some industry contact. And we are definitely still in a stage of the field where things are uh, still fairly early on. There's still a lot of interesting research questions to be had. And I think uh, I've certainly benefited a lot from having both perspectives of uh, some of the industry relevant questions and uh, interactions, as well as some of the academic interactions. Actually, some of the research ideas uh, that, that we had uh, on the on these, for example, these LDPC codes actually came out of interactions uh, that were more on the company side. So I think right now it is still a very fruitful um, collaboration uh, where we are really just trying to push the frontier envelope of the research. And it really is these types of research breakthroughs that also make it possible for the companies to eventually deliver these uh, these large scale quantum computer systems. So I think it is actually very complementary, um, and it's nice that there is still the opportunity to to continue doing a lot of uh, a frontier research, uh, even in a company setting. Not just at Quera, but also at many companies 
across the ecosystem. Excellent, excellent. A, a, a quick note that, like, you know, the, at Wolfram Research, we also have a small quantum team, and we have been, like, you know, actively working on the very abstract level of, like, you know, quantum error correction uh, together with Nick. So I think, like, you know, very soon, like, you know, I'm going to push Nick to have a live stream together to discuss, like, you know, a few fancy things that we have been developing. Uh, as of now, it's very at the very fundamental level. Like, you know, the direct experimental implications, like, you know, we have to wait, wait for it. But that that's also a very interesting thing. So just stay tuned. Like, you know, you, you may hear like, you know, some some good good noises from our side regarding like, you know, error correction. Um, uh, Dolev, like, wh what about you? What's, what's the next step for you? Like, you know, I gather like, you know, you are about to wrap up your PhD in a year or so. So what's, what's going to be next for you? So I would, so I'm, I'm exploring, you know, broadly, but I would like to start my own lab. Uh, that's, you know, uh, I don't know if I should be saying that publicly, but yeah, I would like to start my own lab. Um, and, <laughs> you know, although, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm exploring broadly. Um, uh, I'm still just a PhD student. I'm just in the last year of my PhD. So um, uh, I would like to kind of keep going in this direction. And um, I think that with clever innovations, we can still go very, very far with this technology. At the same time, we should also be trying to engineer things. And here again, collaboration between academia and industry is very interesting. You know, being able to engineer things and kind of in a way that people can actually access over the cloud is kind of amazing. But also I think, you know, being able to do, you know, exploratory work and see what ways we can still make, you know, breakthroughs that, you know, win us factors of a hundred or a thousand is something that uh, I'm pretty keen uh, to keep doing with this technology. I think also what what we're doing with uh you know building a large scale quantum computer i mean that's the goal and you know building this large scale error corrected quantum computer there are a lot of technical challenges associated with it that again we're solving with both you know engineering solutions and also just breakthroughs like scientific breakthroughs but they're not applied only to quantum computing so i mean people we are benefiting from 50 years of atomic physics research and that was benefiting from you know like you know, previous decades of NMR research. Mm -hmm. And if I think very far into the future, in 50 years, we'll still be doing atomic physics. I don't know what exactly, regardless of how quantum computing develops. I mean, people are not going to stop wanting to cool and manipulate mm -hmm. individual particles and control them in, in individualistic ways and do different things with them. One example is fundamental, you know, science and precision metrology. The world's best timekeepers, the best clocks are atoms. And it's not only from the perspective, you know, of like, we want to keep tracking the second very carefully. It allows you, once you can start doing precision science so carefully, it gives you a different lens into the universe. You can start to, for example, understand gravity in different ways. You can even use them as gravitational wave sensors. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's remarkable. And I think the tools we're developing here for building, you know, quantum computers, we should kind of plow ahead, but we should also be keeping our head on a swivel because this technology we're developing here, I think will also be, you know, very applicable to this broad field of atomic physics. Uh, and similarly, you know, we're benefiting from, you know, tremendous progress done in other areas of atomic physics that solve other problems that we then take to, you know, try to use to build our quantum computers. So those are my research interests uh, broadly. Excellent. Forward. Excellent. So like, you know, uh, uh, best of luck, you know, to both of you, I'm sure like, you know, we would hear much more from your success and like, you know, uh, we will have like, you know, more chances to discuss more about your breakthrough. Uh, the special thanks to your audience, like, you know, for your like, you know, uh, engagement and very interesting questions. Uh, Dolev, Harry, any final comments, our audience, any final questions that you may have for our guests? I have one final comment, if I can make this final Please. comment. So the, the uh, I mean, one thing to say, I mean, so we discussed a lot of what we're doing here. What we're doing is obviously not in isolation. I mean, so there's in particular the neutral atom community. It's currently coming up with a lot of very different clever innovations. I mean, we talked about this recent Caltech paper, but there's also things, you know, that, in, you know, in kind of both in the kind of like, ato like ancient atomic physics, but also more contemporary in terms of like optical lattice simulators, you know, um, uh, uh, that that kind of field of research, other areas of atomic physics that are kind of, you know, leveraging similar techniques. In the tweezer community, people are coming up with, you know, different types of atoms that have different types of features, different ways of doing the error correction. And it's a, you know, really unique area. 
Also, we learned a lot from other kind of quantum computing platforms. When we're building our quantum computer, we look at, you know, people have developed these techniques for superconducting qubits and ions, for example. And we think, well, what do they do? And what did this look like? And that's amazing. And, you know, I think that that actually, so, I mean, we benefited so much from all of this kind of different work. And, and we hope that our work is kind of beneficial to the, to the rest of the community as well. Definitely, definitely. Like, yes, like, you know, all of us, like, you know, we are standing on the shoulder of, like, you know, other researchers on many different, like, you know, field of research. And one beauty of quantum, you know, as a topic for research is its interconnection with many other, like, you know, field of research from chemistry all the way to condensed matter physics, like, you know, computer science. And I think, like, you know, this is one of those areas that, like, you know, scientific communities and also uh, the, the industry uh, all of us, we have learned that, like, you know, in order to tackle this very difficult problem, we should work together. And I'm sure, like, you know, uh, the, our audience, like, you know, they would hear much more, you know, about, like, you know, collaboration between the industry, academia, and, you know, the, in our lifetime, hopefully, we would see some of the big promises of quantum computing. Excellent. So, thanks, everyone. Like, you know, special thanks again to, you know, Dolev and Harry uh, from Harvard and Quera for joining us. And you know, looking forward to another session in the future. Uh, have a very good one.